Our first speaker today is Dr. Betsy Lamb, and she is the coordinator of the Ornamentals IPM program at the New York State IPM program. Um, and today, Betsy will be talking to us about fungus gnats and indoor plants. So Betsy, you can take it away. All right, thank you. And I decided I changed my title a little because, you know, we're getting on for, for Valentine's Day, and it seems like fungus gnats and houseplants are a match made in heaven. We'll, we'll talk about why. So if you think you've had fungus gnats in your house, just stick a note in the chat box. Let me see if I can watch, if I can watch the chat. What else you can do? You have to say yes, no, or I don't really know. Currently, yes. Ooh, some, yeah, I always figured you're not going to be the only one so many times. <laughs> Good, then this is a good, even Matt said yes. This is a good, uh, a good topic to, cut, to talk about. So um, truth and advertising, we had fungus nets in the IPM house. Okay, so they're everywhere. So let's see now, go ahead, oops, went twice. So you may have fungus nets, you may have some other things. So here's a, a hint on how to annoy, how to know, how to know your annoying little flying things, things that might be flying around your house plants. There's four possibilities. Um, fungus nets are probably the most common. But so fruit flies occasionally will be near, near fun house plants. They're much more often to be found in, the ki in kitchens because they feed on ripe or overripe fruit. So if you've got something rotting, you're more likely to see uh, fruit flies. But occasionally there's something around your house plants that might attract them. They're about an eighth of an inch long. They tend to have big red eyes and tan and black, black bodies. Another thing you might see, I can truth in advertising, I've had these, are drain flies. And they feed on organic matter in standing water. So standing water will often produce bacteria that'll produce something called a biofilm. So it tends to stay around wet areas, um, hence the name drain flies. Um, and they are about the same size. They're dark color and very furry, but the, the, most, uh, the easiest way to tell them is they hold their wings out in this V shape. So you'll see these little V-shaped flies flying around drains. Um, and again, because if you've got standing water near your house plants, you might also have drain flies or moth flies, filter flies. They have a lot of different names, but they're all the same thing. Shore flies also can be around house plants. They feed on algae. So if you've got enough water to have algae growing, and it's possible that could be growing on the surface of the pot. If you get green growing on the top, it's often uh, algae, or it could be in the saucer if you've had standing water there that will also grow algae and the drain flies will feed on, or sorry, and the, and the shore flies will feed on that. So they look like little house flies, uh, but they tend to have these pale spots on dark wings. That's one way to tell them. Um, and in some of these cases, the adults feed, in some cases, they're just feeding on some liquids or nectar. And in some cases, it's primarily the, the larvae that feed. And the larvae you don't notice right away because they're not flying around and flying up your nose. So it's much more likely that you'll notice the adults than the larvae. And then fungus gnats, the ones we're going to talk about today. They are much more mosquito looking. They've got thinner bodies. They don't have quite as big heads. They do have big eyes, but it's harder to see them because their heads aren't so big. The thing that's indicative, and if you see them flying around, you're not likely to notice this. If you're catching them, um, then you'll see this Y-shaped uh, vein in the wing, and that kind of tells you for sure that you have um, you have a fungus net. Someone asked, are there any good flyer net in terms of having them in their home? Um, probably not. Uh, we usually don't want them flying around in the house. I can't think of anything that would be considered good. I suppose if you had a lot of fungus nets and you happen to have hunter flies in your house for some reason, because they're endemic around and will come into greenhouses without anybody bringing them in, they'd be catching the, the uh, fungus net. So maybe that's a good one. And then that someone mentioned there's also a dark eyed Drosophila that have, has a mottled thorax. So there's some variations in colors depending on uh, which species you have of these different things. So they're called fungus nets because the larvae feed on fungus. They're not feeding on your mushrooms. They probably would if you let them sit around long enough. Um, but it's the, it's the fungus that's growing in the soil, in the soil mix. So if there's any organic matter in the mix that, you're, that your house plants are in, and they almost always have some peat, and that's, a, that's organic matter, they will feed on the fungus that grows on that. And so um, again, they will, if there's enough of them, they may actually start feeding on the plant roots. But usually, 
they are considered, the adults are considered more of an annoyance and sometimes even the, um, the larvae aren't necessarily too damaging. So, you know, they always say you should say something nice about someone if you're gonna say something bad about them too. Um, I lived in the South and I know enough to say, God bless them. <laughs> These are the good things about fungus gnats. They don't bite and the adults don't bite. They don't carry any human diseases. They do actually carry a few uh, plant diseases that the adults can get the spores on their bodies and can move them from plant to plant. They tend to be root rots. In house plants, it's not impossible to get root rots. Um, it's much more common in something like bedding plants in a greenhouse. And as I said, the adults are mostly a nuisance. Yeah, strongly encourage your flies to leave, yes, and, and or um, actually kill them, which we're gonna talk about as we go along. So here's some damage you can see. And I don't know if you can see my cursor. If you look on this root over to the right, there's a fungus gnat larva right there. And that suggests that there, um, that there are a lot and they're actually feeding on the little roots. And so these roots look kind of stubby. You'd expect to see more small roots. And so also if there are leaves that are actually sitting on the soil, the fungus gnat larvae might come up, particularly at night, come up and actually feed on the leaves. Um, if your house plants don't have any, don't have leaves that are touching the soil, the larvae won't crawl up out of the soil, up the stems or anything. They, they stay in pretty close to the soil. So why is this a match made in heaven? Overwatering is probably the most common problem in growing house plants. It's something we just, we're paying attention to our plants. We think they need water. And so we water them to death. Um, and so you've got very wet soil now if you're an overwaterer, and I must admit, I sometimes am an overwaterer. So the moist soil and the medium actually attracts the females to lay eggs. So if you had, if you had two pots, one's dry and one's moist, and you've got adults flying around, they're much more likely to lay their eggs in the one with the moist medium. Um, they're also, the eggs are also a lot more likely to survive if the soil is moist and the larvae like moist soil. If they're mostly water um, and I'll, there's some pictures of them I think coming up. And so if it's really dry soil, they just don't survive very well. So the easiest thing you can do, to, it, well, it's easy unless you just can't stop yourself from watering things. But the easiest thing to do to manage your fungus gnats is to keep the top one to two inches of the soil dry. So you can either water less frequently. If that seems hard, you could water from below so that the water is taken up and it'll help keep the surface dry, um, but don't leave standing water in the saucer again. Um, you can add sand or fine gravel over the top of the pot. And so that's more likely to dry faster. <clears throat> and so um, it will keep the surface drier even if you're still watering the soil beneath that. Um, so both algae and biofilms, again, we talked about those not in terms of fungus gnats so much, but in terms of other kinds of things that can be pests in houseplants. Um, if you've got standing water um, or a really wet soil or a really wet saucer, um, you will more likely to have algae and biofilms also. Um, oh, that's a good point from Deb Marvin. She said, I used a funnel for watering, so water soaked in deeper into the soil and kept the top dry. It's another great suggestion. So yeah, if people have ideas of what they've done that's worked well, feel free to put them in the, in the chat. So you can get artistic with this. I will tell you, if you have this and I come to, my come to your house, you better check my pockets on the way home because um, I will probably steal some of these rocks. But um, you know, if you, if, like me, you have rocks all over the place, it's another way to do it. You can, the whole point is just to have something on the surface that's drier. Adrian says also self-watering pots can do that where, again, the water's coming up from beneath and so the surface stays drier. It'll be interesting to find out if people have tried all these things and still have fungus nets. So feel free to put that in as well. So what else can you do? Again, if you've got a, a plant that's just infested with fungus gnats, um, you can actually, re you may actually have to replant it because even if you, catch all the, the adults, there are still larvae there, they will pupate and form more adults, which will then come out again. So it's not, a, it's not usually sort of a one and done thing. It usually takes a bit of time to, to get rid of all of the larvae and all of the adults. So if you've got a pot that's really infested, you may actually want to replant it. 
And I say with fresh medium. So how do you know your medium's fresh? Well, you don't sometimes. You know, if it's a brand new bag, okay, that's likely to be fresh, um, but you don't know how long it was in a store. So you do the best you can do. Um, I will say that the fungus gnats can live happily in that medium without any plants. And we know that because at Cornell, we took samples of medium from a variety of places, including, including open bins and closed bags and actually incubated it. And we could get fungus gnats out of all of it. Much more commonly out of an open bin, of course. So if you have a big fungus gnat problem and your, and your um, soil mix is in a bag near them and not tightly closed, they may be growing uh, in the in the potting mix as well. This is it's great. This is like true confessions. Linda Swoboda down in Broome County said they had a fungus net outbreak in the CCE office from an open bag of potting soil. It's really easy to happen. You don't usually use a whole bag at once. So try closing it up or putting, if it's possible, put it in another bag and seal that up as well. Um, so make sure that you know. I mean, if you really want to try it, you can put some soilless mix in a dish with a cover and moisten it and see if anything hatches out. It's if you really want to do the science. Um, and so the other, that's the other reason for knocking as much old soil off the roots as possible without damaging the plant. Um, you're trying to get rid of any larvae that are in there and then take that soil and dispose of it uh, somewhere where the, the larvae will not pupate and hatch out into adults. Peat mixes, so anything that has a lot of peat because it's the organic mix, the organic matter, um, they're more attractive to fungus gnats, but those are the most common kinds of soil, soilless mixes or soils that we use. Um, so sometimes it's, you don't have too much choice on that, on that basis. The other thing to do is to use sticky cards. And yeah, sticky cards are uh, usually yellow. You can find some other colors, but the most sensible ones to use in this case are yellow. Um, you can find fancy patterned ones. And on the ones here, the bottom part, the, the little arrow shape is not sticky, the top part is, just so you have something to hold on to when you're trying to put it in the soil. They have some that you can hang on the plant. Uh, and so you can use them for two things. Um, it's, you can use them to, to trap the, the adults or to monitor to see what you've got. Um, anything that gets caught, of course, is not gonna lay more eggs you don't always catch them all and it, and it may depend how many you put out and how often you're changing them and so forth. Um, so we want yellow color because that's what attracts insects. It took me a long time to figure out, oh yeah, sick plants turn yellow and they're often attractive to insects too. So it's the same reason. Um, they mostly catch flying insects. The larvae are not gonna crawl up there, but they'll catch a variety of flying insects. And you can consider them messy, they're sticky. I usually have them stuck in my hair uh, or that can, leaves can get stuck on them. So they have benefits and some of it's like learning, learning how to use them so that um, you catch what you wanna catch and you're not getting other things stuck on them. You can imagine in greenhouses where they have great big long uh, wide pieces of sticky tape throughout the greenhouse. I'm surprised they don't find people stuck on them, but these little guys, you probably won't. So you can also, if you're feeling adventurous, monitor for the larvae with potato slices. You can just cut a potato in slices and put it on the pot, leave it a day or two, and then pick it up and see if you have fungus gnat larvae under there. Um, it, it's not great for a trap. You can collect all the ones you can see, but it, it's gonna get a few of them. Uh, someone asked, is cocoa fiber better than peat? Cocoa fiber is also organic matter. So I don't know that I don't know the answer to that exactly, but my assumption is, it's organic matter. If it will grow fungus on it, it they're not, they're not going to care what kind of organic matter is in there. So I always put this um, this picture up when I'm talking to greenhouse growers. Also, there's two things. One is this: they someone's actually very cleverly put out a, a document that tells you what the insects look like um, when you when you have a sticky trap because we show you these nice pictures of them standing politely. Um, you, when they're on a sticky trap, they're usually not very well displayed. But so you can see there's shore flies with its spots on its wings. And um, I didn't talk about white flies, but here's the Y vein in, um, in the fungus gnat. I didn't mention white flies. You can also have those. Uh, they're a little bit different issue. So I show this slide and I will tell you that I did actually Photoshop the date off of it. They did have a date on it. But if you just look at a sticky trap once and you never look at it again, this doesn't tell you anything. This could be six months worth of insects that you've caught. 
or it could be one day's worth of insect. If it's one day, you probably know because you've got fungus gnats everywhere. Um, but so the, what, what you're trying to determine when you're monitoring is, are the numbers going up or are they coming down? And with just one look or with something where you're not changing it uh, over time, sometimes you can't tell what the numbers are doing. So in terms of monitoring, you do need to change them. <laughs> Somebody wrote, I use the sticky things. They work great and they're, it's gross to see the volume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and someone, Christina Herrick said she used a miracle Grow potting soil that's less prone to gnat infest infestations. Um, I don't know why, but maybe it's got something else in it, uh, or maybe it's just you're a good grower and you keep them dry. So biological control is, it, so the, as I said, the, the best thing you can do is keep the surface dry. It's, it's the cheapest, easiest thing. You can also trap and monitor. You can also use biological control. In this case, um, it's nematodes. These are not nematodes that damage plants. They're nematodes that feed on insects. So they will actually infect and, and kill the larvae if we have plenty of time at the end. I have a lovely video of uh, fungus gnat larvae being infected by nematodes, but I realize it's also lunchtime and you may not want to watch that. Um, so you have to have the correct kind. And in this case, it's Styronema feltii. And so that's the kind that uh, works for fungus gnat larvae. The big question that I have, I've seen it for sale, them for sale from some uh, um, biocontrol companies and so forth. It's hard for me to find anything that looks like it's a small enough volume to really be appropriate for houseplants. So they often come in large numbers, like millions. Um, and so you can actually store them in the refrigerator uh, for a time. And the reason I'm showing you this picture of what, what a live one looks like versus a dead one is if you've stored them in the, in the refrigerator for a while, take a small amount out. They're usually mixed with some kind of a medium. Put it in a drop of water, get out a hand lens, and if they're wiggling and, and sort of S-shaped, they're alive. If they're stick straight like the other ones, they're dead, and there's no point in putting them on. Uh, where do you get sticky cards? Um, you can just Google sticky cards on, online, and you'll find the fancy ones, but most of them are just little squares and I would look around, the prices seem to vary quite a lot. I think you can. You might also be able to get them in plant stores, um, maybe even hardware stores. Uh, and also microwaving your soil to sterilize it, you can. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a big deal to, to fill up your microwave with soil and, and put, you know, to replant your pots. But sometimes people have an oven, they like a, a separate oven where they'll do it or whatever. Um, I don't know how long, that's another thing, is how long, and it, and the thing I would worry about is if there's anything in the soil that's going to spark in your microwave. Um, okay, and so Amara said she's seen them sold, sticky cards sold at garden supply stores. Um, all right, so then there was a question about Bacillus thuringiensis, good for Chuck, he's ahead of the game. Yes, there, there, is, there, there is a type of Bacillus thuringiensis that does work, and it's Israeliensis, so you'll sometimes see it called BTI, there are other types of Bacillus thuringiensis. Blech, bacillus thuringiensis. Um, you have to have the correct one. And for example, this one doesn't work on, on shore flies, but there's another kind that does. Uh, this one's called mosquito bits, and it does actually mention fungus gnat larvae on the label. Um, it is considered a pesticide, and you notice it does have a caution on the label. So you do need to use it appropriately. Uh, and it is one of the softer, we will we'll call it, softer pesticides you can use on this. And, it, and it's formulated so you just apply it to the soil. Never spray, and you, there's really no point in spraying anything for the adults. You just can't control them that way. And who wants to have aerosolized, aerosolized pesticides sprayed around their house anyway? So I did find this one um, in terms of the one called mosquito bits, and there may be others as well. Um, Someone asked about neem oil. And neem oil tends to be something that's applied to the surface of the leaves. And the fungus gnat larvae, fungus gnat larvae are in the soil, so it won't contact them very well. I don't know. I've not seen anything that said using its neem oil drench, for example, would work. And it's not going to work on the adults. They don't, they don't sit around on the leaves enough. And they're not feeding on the leaves, so they're not picking it up that way either. So it's not the it's certainly not the first thing I would try. I would always try drying out the surface first. Okay, that was pretty fast, but maybe we're getting there. So um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for all the great comments in in the chat too. 
Yeah, so Mara says, make you have BTI product that has fungus nets and houseplants listed on the label. And landscaping companies spraying for mosquitoes and ticks. Um, <laughs> I should probably leave that to someone else that's a little bit beyond. I think there are some sprays for mosquitoes that work well. Um, the first thing I would always do is get rid of standing water. Again, we always want you to look at the sort of easy, cheap, and fastest things to do. Um, and then biocontrol options work for outdoor plants or commercial nurseries. Certainly for, there are nematodes that they're in, in large quantities. They, they use the nematodes in for bedding plants and so forth. Um, and there are other kinds, you can buy Bacillus thuringiensis in some different, different forms also that can be applied on a larger scale in nurseries. Um, someone asked about cinnamon. I've never heard of that. Someone did try neem oil on the soil. Um, and whether or not it's actually labeled is another question. And as Amara said, we, you do have to follow the label uh, and make sure that what it is you're trying to control is on the label and also where you're trying to control it. It's easy to buy things that are not actually labeled. Um, and some of the uses that I hear about are actually terrifying and somewhat death defying sounding. Um, so cinnamon, I don't know. I've never heard of anyone trying that. Uh, for, for drain flies, the biggest thing is to keep the drains clean and to get rid of the biofilms as much as possible. Um, and, but of course, you know, drains are beneath where we can actually reach them very well. If you can clear them out, if they get clogs of hair and stuff, you know, if you've ever pulled those out, they're covered with biofilms and they're really revolting. Um, someone said they live down south and they didn't have nets like they have up here. And Matt, tell me when I didn't stop talking. Um, and so part of that is also, we tend to see them in the winter because we're in the house. And so then they become annoying. Uh, so it may be that if you down south, you, things were more open, you didn't notice them or I'm not sure. I can't answer the, that one, I don't know. Natrol, yep, natrol. Um, okay, so natrol is, I wanna say that's the Bacillus thuringiensis. Is that right, Brandy? Oh, and so smaller packages. Um, yeah, tried essential oils and the gnats laughed at you. Are there plants that attract them more than others? Um, I have not seen that it's because again, if it's the soil that they're looking at in the back and the, and the fungus that's growing in the soil. I have lots of questions I can't answer. Um, small hydroponic settings, that's one place where you're going to get um, algae and you may well have shore flies. And so again, anything you can do to prevent the algae building up, either cleaning the whole system with some frequency or um, there's a question as whether or not you can dissolve anything in the water that's gonna get the shore flies. I don't think that's, I haven't seen anything that's labeled for that use. Um, and so um, it's, you can get fungus gnats there also because you can get, you can get actually in, in small hydroponics, you can get all of them because you have all the food sources. So you have, uh, it's like a smorgasbord. Um, tried neem. Um, Joellen put in a, a link for um, other non-biting flies in the What's Bugging You website. Uh, Mitocloprid, I wouldn't use it inside. I don't know, I don't know if there's any, inside labels for that. Again, we're always gonna push you, um, push you to look, read the label if you're using any pesticide and there are better things to do. No, you just put them on the soil for putting the mosquito bits on. You don't put them in water. Wow, I've got, um, yes, it's Bacillus syringensis, natural. Um, diatomaceous earth, if the larvae come up to where it is, it might affect them. All right, I think I'm gonna to have to answer some more in the uh, in, in, on line or something so that we can add the rest of them, but Matt will save them for me. Yes, we will Thank save. Thank you all very, very much. Wow. Thank you, Betsy. Um, obviously a great topic with a lot of interest and um, I'm happy to hear that a lot of people recognize the um, fungus gnats for what they are because people sometimes see these little tiny flies in their homes and have no idea what the pest problem is. So thank you, Betsy. Um, so now we're gonna jump to our IPM Minute. And this is a quick snapshot of a, an issue that is coming up that you can take some action for in the very near future. And for this presentation, uh, we will have Marion Zoufle, who is our vegetable IPM extension uh, area educator 
at the New York State IPM program. And today she's gonna to be talking about starting seeds, uh, sanitation when starting garden seeds at home. So take it away, Marion. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna quickly go over the importance of sanitation when starting your seeds at home. Um, but sanitation is also important throughout the growing season. So I'm gonna mention other important steps you can take to keep your garden healthy. Um, so home gardening has really increased since the pandemic um, and more and more people are also starting their own seeds from home. Here I give just a few reasons why people start their own seeds at home, but I'm sure that there are many others. So I remember back in the spring of 2020 near the start of the pandemic, I was trying to find some tomato plants for my own home garden and it was nearly impossible. Everybody was sold out. And I finally found six tomato plants at a small roadside stand and I bought them. They were all the same variety. So that is one great reason why people start their own seeds. You have the choice of what varieties um, and how many of each. So I had to buy all six. Maybe I didn't want all six of one variety. So by starting your own seeds, you have that option. You can also extend the growing season by starting your own seeds. You can save money. And then you also know how those seedlings were grown. So those are some of the benefits of starting your own seeds, but I'm sure we have also all run into many problems with our seedlings, such as poor germination, um, having leggy seedlings due to a lack of light, mold or fungus gnats, as Betsy just mentioned, due to overwatering, um, slow growth, leaf curl from lack of water or spider mites. But then there's also times when it seems like everything's going great. Your seedlings look wonderful, and then suddenly they die. And this is often caused by a pathogen and is called damping off. So damping off is a common disease and it's often attributed to poor sanitation. It's caused by soil-borne pathogens such as Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, or Pythium. And it causes seemingly healthy seedlings to suddenly fall over. And in this picture, you can see they get kind of this thin thread-like stem or brown right near the soil surface and they fall over. It's often, they, it, this disease thrives in moist environments with poor air circulation, um, and it's brought in with your potting media, um, but also through dirty pots or trays. And this kind of shows the importance of sanitation when you're starting your own seeds. Oops, sorry, went too far. <laughs> um, so damping off pathogen can overwinter in the soil or in pots, but it's important to know where other pathogens may be coming from so that you can reduce the chance of introducing them to your seedlings as well. So some pathogens can overwinter on infected seeds, um, in plant debris, in infected weed hosts, insect vectors, um, and on the surface of your garden tools. Sorry, I'm having a problem with my advancing. <laughs> Um, so sanitizing your containers um, is important because it will reduce the disease inoculum that you might be bringing into your new, your young seedlings. But it's important to sanitize the containers, but anything else that you might be using, such as your stakes or your garden tools. So when you sanitize, first you want to wash, you want to remove all the soil. Um, this increases the effectiveness of any kind of disinfectant you're gonna use after you wash. So you just do this in warm soapy water and you can use you know, a rag or a brush to get the dirt off. You're then gonna to want to disinfect all your containers and there are several products that you can use to disinfect. I'm gonna mention two products, but I have a link that I think Matt's gonna hopefully post for me in the chat to some other options that are available to you. Um, the two that I'm gonna mention is a 10% chlorine bleach um, that you can soak your trays in for about 30 minutes. This works really well. It is corrosive um, to some of your garden tools. So you're gonna wanna make sure you rinse those off afterwards, get the bleach off of them. You could also use rubbing alcohol. Uh, the benefit of this is that you can just wipe the containers um, rather than soak them in, in the rubbing alcohol. You can just get a rag and wipe them with it. So sanitizing your containers will help eliminate the source of some pathogens, but not everything. So for example, you could still be bringing in pathogens through your infected seed. Um, it's therefore important to, if you're saving seed, to know that the parent plant was not diseased. Um, if you're buying seed, to buy it from a trusted supplier. You could also potentially treat your seed with a hot water treatment. Um, this can be 
you have to do this very exact. Uh, again, Matt, I hope is gonna post a link to how to use hot water treatment to treat your seed. It does have to be at a right temperature for a certain amount of time. So you don't wanna just throw your seeds into boiling water. It's pretty specific how you do it. Um, and then some other things to keep in mind, if you're having a reoccurring disease problem, you may want to see if there is a resistant variety available that you could plant. Um, you also wanna make sure that the potting soil or potting media that you use is sterile. Um, if you are buying in any transplants, you want to make sure they're healthy before you introduce them into the garden. You don't want to be bringing disease into your garden. And then throughout the growing season, you want to remove any potential weedy hosts, um, any volunteer plants that may be carrying diseases. If there is an infected plant, you want to reduce, um, get rid of it so you can reduce the spread of disease. Uh, so that's all I have. Um, it's still early February right now. It's a perfect time to go into your shed or garage or wherever you keep your pots and clean them and sanitize them and get them ready for the growing season. So I don't know if there's any questions, I can stop sharing. Well, thank you, Marion. Um, excellent presentation. I think it's a topic that, you know, me as a new-ish gardener is, I would have never thought about it before about disinfecting all the pots and tools. So hopefully this helps people to grow their seedlings at home in ways that minimize exposure to these pathogens. Um, there are some questions in the chat. I think we will ask you to answer them um, at a later date in the essence of time. So we do want to thank everybody for attending today and for the great presentations by Betsy and Marion. I'm going to post in the chat um, the link to register for 2022 events. We'll also be distributing this um, in multiple channels, as well as our uh, YouTube channel where you can watch previous events. So thank you everyone for your time and have a great weekend.